Welcome to Writing the Wrong Way, uh, where we talk about how writing works, how writers work, and how the best writers risk being strange. But what I find strange, personally, Catherine, is when people talk about their lives. And uh, I know that it's a normal thing that makes me strange, um, but I'm curious uh, to talk to uh, you. Uh, this is Catherine Hunter we're talking to, who is a poet, professor, novelist, and uh, all-around uh, great person. and. Uh, Catherine, in particular, uh, I wanted to talk to you as somebody who's done a lot of writing in a lot of different ways. Uh, but I know specifically the thing that kind of comes to my mind uh, of your more recent work is this book you wrote called After Light, uh, which uh, concerns, uh, I think is, an, is a novel, uh, but also concerns some actual uh, events that kind of connect to your family's history. And so I was wondering if you could uh, just sort of talk a bit about what that book is and kind of maybe a bit about your process of writing it. And in the course of that, I think we can maybe open the discussion up to just sort of broader uh, concerns around, you know, writing fiction or nonfiction or poetry and so on. Uh, but could you talk to maybe just start with about that particular book? Yeah, sure. That's, uh, it's a great topic. And it's, um, and I'll talk first about Afterlight, and then we can go on. And I would also like to talk a little bit, uh, so I hope I don't forget, to talk a little bit about teaching. Yeah, um, absolutely. Know, talking, talking to students about writing your family history or whatever it is. So um, so in my family, uh, you know, there were some, um, well, one thing I was mainly, I guess, my father was a kind of, um, um, he passed away in like 1999, so it's a long time ago, but uh, growing up with him was um, really quite an experience, and he had had a very uh, dramatic life that had in it uh, a narrative arc, uh, like kind of of, of well, like very heavy drama. And um, he did want to write about his own life, but it was very difficult for him to do that. He was a pretty good teller of stories, and he could give things a bit of a dramatic twist. And um, also his sister, uh, my aunt, um, who lived in uh, New York. Um, so I didn't talk to her a lot, but sometimes we'd visit her in New York or she would phone. She used to always phone on American Thanksgiving, for example. And uh, she told me some kind of amazing stories from, from the family history uh, on my dad's side. But uh, anyway, so my father grew up in, um, in Brooklyn. New York at a time when, you know, in a very poverty stricken um, time of, um, I guess, the 20s and 30s, the 30s. And uh, the family had, you know, they had many, many children. Um, the, his dad was unemployed a lot. And um, so I heard a lot of these stories. Uh, it was like a ghetto when he grew up. When, um, he was in about grade five, he dropped out of school. So he had a grade five education. And then he started learning how to do bricklaying and carpentry and th those kind of jobs. So he was really quite successful. He's a hardworking kind of guy. And, um, and then the war broke out and Canada, like, the, like Britain declared war on Germany, blah, blah. You don't need a history lesson from me. But um, in 19, uh, I think it was in, I think it was in 1940. Uh, my dad was, you know, learning about what the Nazis were doing in Germany and all of this, and he decided he wanted to go over there and fight in the war. But because uh, the United States was not in the war yet, um, he went up to Montreal uh, from New York, which is not far, and uh, joined the Black Watch and went to fight for the Canadian Army, and that's why we're Canadian now. So what happened to my dad during the war, though, was that at you know, he's about 25, 26 years old, and he had both his, he had a big explosion and severe damage to his face, and he lost both of his eyes. So um, there's a phrase, you know, among blinded people, which is uh, totally blind. And that's what he was. He could not see at all, no light, no, no nothing. So then he had to go through this rehabilitation, um, emotionally, physically, mentally. And then uh, the Canadian government offered him like that he could go to university. So he had to work very hard to upgrade from grade five 
to uh, handle the University of Toronto. And then he ended up getting a master's in social work. And while he was there, uh, a very lovely uh, young woman who had volunteered to read to the blind um, ended up being my mother. Anyway, so that's where they met. And um, so over the years, uh, you know, he would tell these stories to us, like little vignettes kind of from his life. And um, he actually got me to, to write them down sometimes. But as he was talking, like he's just writing is just really, really hard. And he, had, you know, he had no experience in doing it. He did definitely have this flair for drama and for the shape of a story. And for the often the, the, the some of the moments that he would put into these stories, you'd be like, oh wow, right? Like that should be really a book, you know, or a story. So uh, anyway, after he uh, passed away, I felt like I really wanted to kind of write the story of my dad. And that I ran into um, the problem I ran into was lack of evidence um, of what really exactly happened. And I ended up doing a lot of research. Um, but at one point I decided, no, you know what? I have to fictionalize this. It's the only way I can tell this story is to turn it into fiction. And then um, interestingly enough, after I just made that decision and then I did all this um, research work into the National Archives of Canada and everything, I actually did find out a lot of those blanks, you know, what had happened where, but it was impossible to really figure out for sure, for sure, which boat he was on, say at Dieppe, like he was part of the Dieppe parade. And you could see that on his record, you know? Um, but anyway, I learned a lot about uh, military uh, history while I was doing this, so it's kind of interesting. And it's, you know, the military history is all about the generals and uh, the politicians and these big campaigns. And, you know, like you see on TV, there's a map and they're sticking pins in the map. But what I wanted to tell was the story of the soldiers on the ground, you know, and what happened to them. So um, I was nervous about this book. Oh, and then I had to, I decided I had to write about uh, the generation before him. Sure. And uh, so my aunt had told me about um, our grandmother, but it was really our grandmother's sister. But I turn her, you know, by the magic of fiction, uh, I turn her into my character, my blinded character, whose name was Frank. Uh, I turn her into his mother because her story was just more interesting than the story of my actual grandmother. So this would have been my great aunt, I guess. Hmm. And um, because she had been in Ireland, uh, forced at, as a teenager, um, forced to marry this widower, um, who would have been in his 40s, uh, or at least 40, and who already had children. Um, and this was, this was very common, I didn't realize it, but uh, when I was started doing research, I saw many uh, allusions to, you know, especially at, um, oh, help me out here, Jonathan. When, when immigrants come into New York, they go to an island called uh, Ellis Island. Ellis Island, Island, yes. Yes, Ellis Island. And uh, when I was there reading, you know, our history about immigrants, um, many European women were in that situation and certainly in Ireland, right? You're living in poverty, there's not enough. And that's a whole other historical lesson, which I won't go into, but um, so I thought that was really interesting. And my, what my aunt had told me when I was quite young, so say I would be maybe 12 and I'm hearing this story about this woman who was 15 or 16 and was forced into marriage to this guy. And I remember my aunt saying, in her Brooklyn accent, which I can no longer imitate, she's been gone too long, but uh, she was saying, um, and they told her, you know, you've got to marry him because, you know, he's, he's rich. He's got a bicycle. You know? <laughs> yeah, got a bicycle. And I, think he maybe had a, I think he maybe yeah. had a donkey as well. So, you know, this was considered the wealth. And I can remember that very distinctly listening to this and going, oh my goodness, right? This is... Hmm. Uh, this is a story. I want to know more. And um, so I know, anyway, I end up sort of making up this whole family. Um, so sometimes, you know, people ask me, well, what, what parts of that were like so-called real? 
And um, interesting because do you know whether, you know, the stories that your aunts and grandparents and even your own parents told you when you were growing up about other people in the family, uh, you know, because they're inevitably going to leave something out either by accident or on purpose, or there's going to be things that they didn't know. Well, one of the things that I find really interesting in that wider arena of like, well, what actually happened, you know, because as you say, there's like, you know, a level at which you can maybe find documents or records. Uh, but, you know, even those uh, will be incomplete or, or just potentially wrong, right? You know, something, as you know, from working in the university, if there's yeah. one form that says it, another form will say it, and it doesn't necessarily, and there's a level at which at a certain point in history, now we're just relating to the previous form and not necessarily to reality anymore. Um, and may or may not accord to reality, but you know, there's a, there's a wonkiness there often. Uh, but the thing I find really interesting uh, in terms of people's memories in particular and trying, and different people remembering the same things uh, is that of course you can't trust that. Like uh, when, in fact, I, I, I remember reading somewhere that uh, when they do um, investigations, uh, one of the, the tip-offs, you might know more about this as somebody who's researched, you know, uh, to write mystery novels. But one of the tip-offs I understand in an investigation is everybody has the same story, they're probably lying. And the, yes. <laughs> like, if they're not inconsistencies, then likely it's a fabricated story. Yes, in a criminal investigation, yeah, it's like, because they're like talking to each other, we've got to get our story straight, right? Yeah, by great. accident or design, they've just repeated a story rather than maybe what the facts were. Yeah, yeah, interesting. And your sibling, this is a common among siblings, right? You grow mm -hmm. up together and then, you know, you're older and you're all sitting around and somebody will say, oh, remember that time that, you know. Remember that green bike? It's like, well, that bike was blue. That's right, you know? exactly. And it turns out it was actually purple <laughs> when you yeah. find a photograph, right? <laughs> yeah, or it was, a, it was, you know, mm -hmm. a tricycle or something. Like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and um, a lot of arguments uh, occur among siblings about stuff like that. And in my family, we've just learned to go, oh, well, whatever, right? Um, <laughs> yeah. Something like that happened along the way somewhere. And you, know, you also, I've also experienced uh, moments of awareness, which are kind of rare, uh, in myself, where I suddenly realized, oh, no, that's a crossover. Yeah element from a different time and um i can remember once this happening uh, actually within the space of about an hour when i had seen somebody somewhere and then i was asked to report like what i had seen and i told them and i told them you know what he was wearing and then i actually realized after no that wasn't him wearing that that was the guy that was just walking down the you know hall like a different guy because, yeah, well, you're not. They've done brain studies into this thing too. Like when you actually remember something, you don't remember something. Like you don't recall it from, you know, it's, say, it's being saved on your brain computer, right? You're actually fabricating the memory in the telling of it. Like in remembering it, you create the memory. And so sure, there's something it's based upon, but it, it, you know, very quickly these things change and grow. And you start remembering the memory that you had last time instead of the original thing. So it, but what I think is interesting in all this, there's a couple of things that are really interesting in there, but where I kind of wonder, and maybe this kind of bleeds into another topic, which is uh, teaching writing, uh, which is like when you kind of are moving past, say, um, telling family stories or, or this communal activity and trying to move towards like something you might publish and share with the wider world, or, or you might just want to craft into an artistic form. Like what are some of the things that you think kind of need to be considered uh, when we're not just creating, say, a fiction, but something that is containing these elements of uh, actual life or actual people, like for the, you know, even though you wrote a novel, for example, you know, it is family history that you're getting in there. And I'm, sh and it's not just, of course, you that has an opinion on the family history, right? Yeah. Uh, so how do you kind yeah. of contend with that or think about that or negotiate that or, or or what do you advise people who want to write about their experiences and but of course keep in mind their experiences aren't just theirs right that's right so um i have is very common for students uh, you know um of all ages and at all, at all levels to ask me to say something to me like this well you know um 
my aunt, you know, was this uh, very cruel person, right? And she did these terrible things to us. I'm making this up right now, but, um, uh, and I really want to write about that because it affected me, right? Uh, so deeply. And, um, but I'm afraid, you know, because my mom will be really angry, right? If I write this stuff about her, her sister or whoever, uh, or it might be their own parents, right? Or their grandparents or their brother or sister or something like that. And they really want to tell these stories. So depending, it depends. My advice always depends on how far along this person is in the project and how far along this person is in their um, experience as a writer, right? So if it's somebody who's just starting to write stuff, um, and I teach, you know, people in poetry as well as uh, prose. So, and I, I actually would like to talk about that a little bit, but uh, mm -hmm. in a second, but I often will say, uh, I have been known to say to somebody, well, you know what? How people feel when a book comes out, you know, worrying about that, that's step number 6,492. And you're at step number 26. So, you know, don't worry about it right now. Um, and uh, if it is, you know, it, but if it's really developing and come, coming along, uh, I think that sometimes, um, and this is a weird psychological thing that I don't even know if, um, if it's real or if it's just me, but I think that, some, that characters' names are really important. And there's been times when I've been struggling to write a, a story, totally fiction, right? And uh, I can't think of the right name for that person. And it really bugs me. And so I'll be writing, putting in like an X or Bob or something, you know what I mean? And I know I haven't found the real name yet. And then when I find the real name, suddenly, brrr, uh, you know, things start to happen, you know, to shape. So if you were writing about, you know, you're at Griselda, um, Maybe you start off using her real name, you know, just for yourself, for your own memories and things. And then I always tell people, like, you have to have um, a private place, uh, you know, like where you can lock up a notebook or keep it somewhere where nobody can get it or it's on your computer. You know, you have to have a password. And um, I can remember people telling me terrible stories about, you know, their mother read their diary or whatever. And uh, I say, well, you know, once you're, an, you know, an adult, uh, you need to live with people who respect your privacy. And uh, if they don't, then, you know, you need to lock things up and it to who you live with. <laughs> but that's, a, that's more of a life problem that I don't like to get into counseling people. Mm -hmm. But um, but I have you know, given this advice because you have to feel secure as you begin to write it that nobody's you know if you're worried about what your family is going to think you have to know that they're not going to see it and then you keep going and then there's a shift at one point where you well you have to decide say it's prose you really have to decide whether it's going to be a memoir in which case there's an expectation that you will use uh, that you will tell like the truth as far as we know it. Um, and even in memoir, sometimes people, um, I'm just, li I'm just listening actually to an audiobook um, about a terrible series of marriages that this woman had, and she has changed people's names. But at the beginning of the book, she says, this is all true, right? I've just changed their names because some of these really super abusive guys, I'm sure they would, I don't know what they would do to her. But um, so you can alter names in a memoir, but we all know, like, say you live in Winnipeg, everybody, everybody knows yeah. you, everybody knows who your brother is and all of those things. So uh, it becomes difficult. So you can do, but you can tell the emotional truth as fiction, right? You can disguise, uh, You when we were talking earlier, uh, Jonathan, you used the word coded, right? So you can yeah. code things. Um, or disguise them in some way. And you know what's a really good trick when writing a, a fictional story that's based on something real? It's just to uh, change the gender um, because people never seem to suspect that. So maybe I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> but, uh, 
yeah, sure. to change, change the gender, change the name, change the relationship. You know, if in real life you're writing about your brother, um, totally change it. Put him in a different city, give him a different occupation. You know, uh, don't have the narrator related to him at all or do a third person narration. You know, there's all these ways that you can get at emotional truth, right? I, I've always felt like uh, Werner Herzog has this idea of the ecstatic truth, you know, this uh, notion that somehow it, it, it doesn't attend to the facts of the case so much as it attends to the emotional quality of the case, but also um, could include certain facts that help to anchor it in, yeah. you know, like there's a level of selection involved, um, but he's prior and, and Herzog, of course, in his films will do like weird combinations of fiction and, and uh, nonfiction. Like he'll he'll make a fictional film where he does about a guy who's hauling a boat over a mountain, and then he does haul a boat over a mountain in the course of making that film, right? Like uh, he'll do these weird hybrids. Um, but so to me, like. Uh, there's, it's hard for me to kind of counsel people around it because what I don't, I tend to sort of avoid it in certain ways, in part because I'm kind of a private person, but more, I think, because I don't think it's super interesting. Like I have this idea that like, even though I've had interesting experiences and have had like, you know, uh, you know, drama in my life, like, I feel like my joke about it is, you know, as a, you know, straight white male age, you know, 25 to 65, like my opinions and feelings are represented in the culture already, <laughs> you know, and like me writing my story, it does have a value, but it doesn't have say the value that somebody with a more unique experience might have, you know, like, uh, so that's just more joke than anything, but like there is, I think a level at which, I try to keep in mind when I'm writing that, like, even though something may have felt very um, unique and specific to me, it doesn't mean that it is, uh, you know, probably 10 million people had that thing happen to them in some different form. And so unless I can go the extra step of trying to find something particular in it, you know, that's, so I usually just will cut to that, you know, I'll just cut to like, well, what's interesting about me going through it from a more of a third party objective point of view is actually this feeling. And so it doesn't have to attach. So if I just get at that feeling, maybe I'll just make the whole thing surrealist uh, and not connect it to reality anymore, as long as I get that feeling out. But other people might be finding it more necessary. I recognize though that other people might find it more necessary to work uh, through those things that have happened to them in writing in a different or more direct way. And, uh, um, and there's a value in that, like I say, especially if, you know, somebody has had a, um, like a more kind of unique uh, experience in, 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 a, in such as, or, or one that could help others and isn't so overrepresented in the culture as say what, you know, some of the things that happened to me. You know, uh, so it's hard though, because it's hard to know how to advise somebody about it with, uh, I think you're getting some really you know, interesting practical things. So one, just the idea that you would worry about it later, uh, how, what people are going to think, because you may find by the time you get to that point, you don't even care anymore. Like after you write it, you may not even care about sharing it anymore uh, for yes. some people, right? In which case it never becomes an issue what somebody's going to think about it if it's just for you. Uh, ultimately, whether you realize that at the start or after you've written a draft or two of it, you know, uh, I think you're right to point out that like probably a lot of people are torturing themselves over things they don't need to, if only for that reason. And, there, and a lot of them are just learning to write. Yeah. So, you know, um, writing about your childhood is uh, what Rilke says, that's your jewel, right? That you have. Yeah. And, uh, and then uh, I, uh, I always like to add to students, even if your childhood was really rotten and a lot of suffering, that's still material, right? Yeah. So, um, yeah, so they're just learning to write. And if this is a story that they really want to get out, um, yeah, I think they should write it. But don't worry yet. Like later, and you know, a lot of writers return again and again and again. 
to the hard knot, you know, that's at the center of some of the things that occurred to them when they, you know, happened to them or that they did when they were young. Sure. I think especially in the case of people who have survived horrific experiences, you know, or violence or terrible accidents or acts of terror that other people have perpetrated upon them, uh, they kind of need to go through that material. And uh, if they are writers, they'll do it through through writing. And then and then you really do have to learn how to write, right? So mm -hmm. you may write that story seven times in your life. And I'm not counting all the drafts, right? It's funny and, that you say that. I, I, it makes me think of this when you mentioned the real key childhood, you know, is your jewel. It actually makes me maybe think of in, in my in the National Gallery, I have this long sequence about Wilkie, like rewriting right. Wilkie's uh, elegies, Duino elegies. But um, what's interesting, but in that book and also in uh, my other, my short story book, Lighting Impossible Storms, I took my the same childhood experience, which is this moment I found this bird, uh, this dead bird, and I it looked like it was alive and I turned it over. You know, I picked it up to maybe help it, but it was just maggots inside the bird making it move, seeming like it was alive and just fell apart in my hands. Like that was really, I mean, it's it's a, it's a moment that was just a really powerful childhood moment for me. And I actually literally put it into two books in different ways, but it's the same story, you know? And uh, it, it's it, it, like, I had to approach it differently in both cases so that it would fit. And like, there's all these artistic considerations that come into it, but part of it's just like that weird, for whatever reason, that was a thing for me that moment, right? And you never know until you really start writing even what in the, those moments in your life actually affected you. Like, I, I don't know if you've had, I've have had that experience where it would have actually have written about my life. Like the thing I thought actually was the big deal to me wasn't, it was some other thing inside of it, you know? And until I really had um, put it down on paper, I couldn't see it, you know? Like you can't really even see inside your own head until you start to externalize it in, in a sense. Yeah, I agree, yeah. And, uh, you know, I think there's been uh, so many, unfortunately, kind of uh, phony or flaky, you know, people saying, you know, teaching writing as therapy, that it has become really something I absolutely abhor to say or to, and I avoid saying, but it's actually true that there, that there can be a lot of uh, inner healing um, when you write these things out and sometimes it's uh, it doesn't it's not healing right away sometimes it's sure. uh, very difficult and you're like why did I why did I do this and you know it's it's painful uh, and and then there, there's a couple things I want to say about genre too with writing about mm -hmm. family um, you're so when you start off writing a memoir or um, you know about your own life or maybe your dad's life for example um you and then you start thinking about you know getting it published unless you're famous right uh yeah. you, there's there's no market for it you know and i think that there might have been in the past a market for my father's story true story right of a blinded vet who because everybody who heard about him you know, back in the 60s and 70s was like, oh, what? I really amazed, you know? And um, like, I remember one time we had had a, what was it? A, something in our house that required the police to be there. It might've been that time we had a fire maybe, or maybe something had been stolen. I don't know. But um, my mother was showing the um, police or the fire guys around. And then uh, later they said, well, you know, Mrs. Hunter, uh, you know, there's something about your story that just, you know, doesn't ring true because you told us that your husband was totally blind and uh, you've got all these power tools down there in the, in the basement. And my mom's like, oh yeah, those are his, you know, he uses them. They're like, what? And so all the things that he did, everyone, <laughs> I, can, I can remember people all the time saying, oh, your dad's so amazing, you know, mm -hmm. but um, uh, what made that so amazing were all these myths about disability Right. And people not sure. people never wanting to get uh, close to anybody that was, you know, as that severely disabled. And so not getting to know them and all these sort of things. So nowadays, I don't think, you know, it had to be a really, really well written book to sell at all. 
but there'd be no way to market it, you know? Sure. Um, so there's that. And then there's the, so the, the genre of memoir, right? I don't think you can just write your life story unless you've done something fantastic or you're already famous for some other reason. So then there's lyric poetry, uh, which is also very tricky um, in mm -hmm. terms of, is it true or not? Because we, you know, and I think especially as uh, teachers of English, you know, as academics, as well as being poets, both of us, uh, you try to teach the poem, you try to separate that I, right, from the actual poet um, in a way that is, I think I'm better at explaining it now than I was when I first started teaching, because now I, I, I've learned to say, well, you know, that's just the way Sylvia Plath was feeling maybe, maybe that day that she started writing the poem, you know? And then after that, she took a step back and she started, you know, and I showed them her drafts, you know, like she, she started crafting it and shaping it, you know, into, into a work of art. And that we have many selves, different selves inside of, you know, of us, right? And we might feel one way one day and another. That doesn't mean that that person walked around feeling that way all the time. I say Dylan Thomas, we're not drunk every day, please. Uh, certainly not when he was writing. And um, so, there's but, also a, 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 sorry. There's also an interesting craft problem, I think, with that eye when you're trying to teach it. Because I don't know what, how you found it, but what I found is that um, people have this. People don't want to separate the eye, uh, right? And yeah. the reason they don't want to often is because they feel like it's somehow inauthentic, but also won't be impactful. So they feel like so. But what? I, well, I'll, I'll often try to convince people of is that what you have to think through is you know how is a reader going to receive it yeah and your task like if you want to write a poem about how you you love your dog i think the problem is that you can't just say that how much you love your dog because that's not that's not interesting to anyone else what you need is them to love the dog you know so you need to show them how that dog is lovable <laughs> And why you felt you like you have to kind of make them fall in love with the dog, the way that you fell in love with it, and she, by replicating that moment, maybe or whatever. Like you have to kind of put them in your shoes rather than focusing on your 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 eye so much, or you just can't have the intended effect. It's you know otherwise it's like, I <laughs> so it's like when you you know your friend walks up to you and starts telling you about their day, and you're like, well, what do I care about any of this stuff? But it matters to them. Yes. Right. But if they like had, if you'd gone through their day, it would maybe matter to you too, but you need to have those moments first. Well, and if, if it's my friend telling me that I care because that's my friend. Sure. You're already, you you're already writing, care about them. Yeah, yeah. But when you're writing a poem, you're writing to complete strangers. And uh, I think that's one of the hardest things to mm -hmm. teach is that um, I hate to tell you this, but the person reading your I mean, what we are aiming for in terms of craft is for that piece we just wrote to interest a complete stranger. I, I like to suggest a hostile stranger. Like imagine somebody doesn't want to read it. <laughs> Christian Book told me that once, you, you know, the people don't want to read poems, you know, they'd rather have a blank piece of paper is worth more than one with a poem written on it. And, uh, <laughs> you know, you could at least, you know, put something, you know, you know you'd have to throw it away. Uh, you can't even put it back in the printer. And, um, uh, I think it's, you know, it's, it's kind of an overstatement, but it, I think it, there's something in that in terms of like how hostile a reader can be uh, potentially, you know, to like your point of view. Now, obviously, if they went and bought the new Catherine Hunter book, they care about what Catherine Hunter has to say, but that's not really where a lot of people are coming into the book from, you know? Yeah, and they, so, and I was, when you said somebody who really doesn't want to read a poem, I was picturing, you know, an overworked editor who was just yeah. Yeah. 16, 16 hours going through the slush pile. Um, yeah, so it has to somehow uh, stand out. But this idea that, um, like, even if we fully understand about separating the I, you know, out, and a lot of very sophisticated uh, poets still don't understand that, they're saying, I don't like these lyric poems. It's all I, I, I. It's all about me, me, me. And I'm like, no, that's a trope. Yeah. <laughs> you know, of lyric poetry. Like, it's not, I don't know what, I don't know where they're coming from. But uh, I made, but, I made uh, a joke about that in the National Gallery. You know, po I think I've got a line where, like, 
poets offer to speak truth, but then only speak of themselves. But it's a bit of a, you know, that's like the cliche of it, right? You know, that people have this idea uh, that it's somehow self-absorbed when, of course, a, a good poem is not doing that. It's maybe seeming to do that, uh, but yeah, it's, it's doing surface. this other thing. Uh, yeah, and, but it's doing this more tricky uh, movement. Yeah, so uh, what people do expect, like for, I mean, one example I've used in teaching is um, now my, uh, my mother has passed away long ago, but um, if my mother were, I'm trying to think of somebody who in my life who is still alive, but uh, and it's also tricky because I don't want to curse anybody with bad luck, but uh, say my mother was alive and uh, I wrote a poem about the death of my mother and how sad I was over at and going to, to you know, her funeral and what flowers I put on her grave and all of this. And then I sent that to a magazine and it got published. Uh, well, my other poets who knew me, I, I tell my students, they would be writing to me from all across the country saying, oh, I'm so sorry to hear that your mom died. And then if I said to them, oh, you guys, that wasn't real, it's just a poem. You know, my mom's fine. They would like dislike me a lot, right? They would think I was, <laughs> what is yeah. wrong with you, right? Uh, so, we, so it's a convention that we very much uh, live with uh, on a very basic practical level. And I think people do understand that, you know, you do change some details in a poem, right? Um, you put in dandelions instead of pansies because it has the right number of syllables or, <laughs> or it fits in with the pa color pattern that you're working with or something like that. So you change small details, but you don't write a story about like, I would never, or a poem, a lyric poem, I would never write a lyric poem about like growing up in Texas, you know, because I, I didn't. <laughs> so it's, anyway, it's interesting to think about what's real and it, talking about your family, you know, any family things you say in a lyric poem, people are going to take them as, as being true. So yeah. Well, think about. I think something also, that is a hard thing uh, for students to think about. Well, anyone, not just students, but a hard thing for writers to think about, I think, is if you're writing about something that has some basis in life, um, there's the perspective fact, you know, the fact that you have your perspective on it, but another person involved doesn't have that same perspective. And uh, you have to contend with that uh, potentially in a very real way, maybe, you know, like it's not likely that they would sue you, but in some, you know, if, if, right. Theoretically, if you're writing about, you know, comrade black and what he's done to you, he might sue you. <laughs> right. But like, uh, on the less extreme example, um, you know, people remember things differently, uh, and they have different points of view on them and they have their reasons for X. You may just, so there's a level of research, even weirdly, you kind of just to go back to the research thing for a second. Um, I'm curious to know, like what kind of research you did or might suggest people do if they are kind of at that later stage where they're really thinking about publishing something that does involve, um, you know, other people in their life and so on. Like, because what do you, suggest or suggest people even just think about uh, in terms of like you know whether you ask somebody and get their permission or do you get like their point of view at least even if you don't agree with it like do you try to represent them or do you not do that like what are some of the things you kind of yeah. in terms of contending with other people's points of view or their feelings about you know these events what do you sort of suggest or think about when when that stuff comes into play um, I, 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 I think trying to avoid it actually. Yeah, uh, that's what I know, usually do, but I don't know if it's a, if you're, <laughs> the if you're writing, you know, if you want to write a story that's set in a certain time period and you're lucky enough that your grandparents are still around and uh, you have a good relationship with them. Um, then I think uh, it's great to say, you know, hey, can we talk about, you know, I want to set this story um, back in Portage la Prairie in the you know, 1950s or whenever you were living there. 
Um, could you just talk about that? It's going to depend what kind of person your grandmother or whoever it is is, right? Some people love to tell stories. Um, my dad liked to tell these stories, right? And so I was all the time, I don't think he realized, you know, oh, she's going to grow up to be a writer. Or maybe he did, you know, sometimes I, and I was worried about that book because even though it's fiction, um, it has this severely traumatized, blinded veteran who's very violent, you know, um, it's obviously my dad. So I was afraid uh, certain things about what my brothers would think, you know, about him. And uh, so I remember saying to my one older brother, um, you know, after it came out, I said, I feel kind of bad in some ways about the way I portrayed this character, you know, and I don't know what dad would have thought. And my brother said to me, are you kidding? Dad would have loved it. So, you know, because I think he, my brother is saying to me, dad wanted people to see how he was suffering, you know? Sure. Because it, all of that was kept secret in the family, right? In those days, he was, everybody thought he was this amazing, wonderful person, right? And he, he was an amazing, wonderful person, but he also had this, you know, severe problems and um, that we all kept quiet about, you know, crazy culture we live in. Just Yeah, but, but it is a cultural thing, right? That, that I think it still hasn't fully gone away, although it's Ooh. lessened in many ways. There's that idea, you know, and, and in some ways you can see like, you know, different people have their points of view and it's hard to kind of sort everything to sift away the points of view and just look at like the objective data of it. And it's not even interesting, you know, like why was the great failure of um, the, um, uh, uh, I forget the names all of a sudden, but the, 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 uh, the novelist, the new novel uh, where, you know, <laughs> Jonathan Franzen. No, the, it's, it's literally uh, the nouveau Romain nouveau. Uh, oh, great. Yes. Yeah. Um, where they're just, you know, here's how many bananas were on the tree. It's like, well, okay. <laughs> but it's interesting in, in, in a certain, you know, experimental way, but there's a limit uh, to its interest. Um, unless you start to, and even, you know, and they also just found it, it's impossible to not bring the perspective in because the recording selection of the, you know, facts you pay attention to starts to become a perspective. You know, I, I remember once um, having an argument with a newspaper journalist and they were saying, you know, people have this idea that you can't write by unbiased articles, but I do all the time. And I said, and I said, well, you know, uh, it, but when you write about a war, I go, do you report on what the ants think yeah. or how many ants got squashed? I go, of course not. You know, so even if you're being balanced, you have a human perspective uh, and it's not right or wrong, but it's something to consider. Um, and there's other human perspectives, uh, you know, that kind of, and, and it gets very messy very quick. Right. Um, and yeah. so I, I feel like in some ways, like my answers often like try to avoid it or disguise it. Uh, so that you can at least serve your own purposes, but you know, hide what you're doing <laughs> from people who might hate you, to, you for it. You um, have to protect yourself, I feel. Um, at the same time, I don't know if that's the best advice uh, in the sense of like, it then kind of protects the situation from, in, it, it protects people from, and, and kind of allows for things to occur. So it's a, it's a tough bind though, I feel. Well, it's personal in many ways. You know, the writer Carol Shields has, you know, made a point of saying in a couple of essays that, um, or in conversation, that uh, she doesn't want to hurt anybody in her life. She just doesn't want to. Her art is not that important to her that she feels that she has to, you know, put these terrible truths out there. Um, and so it is kind of up to the personality of the person. And, you know, anybody who's met Carol knows that she's very nice. And, um, and I also feel in a way that uh, as a human being, I have some kind of responsibility to other people um, that I can't, that it's wrong for me just to say, well, it's my art, you know, I'm an artist, I have to do this because um, a lot of the things that I also have experienced 
or that people very close to me have experienced are horrific, traumatic things. So, and you know, it's one of the reasons I've just been recently, uh, anyway, never mind, don't want to get into that, but <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a, it would take us off topic, but there's a lot of times when, you know, you've witnessed something that's really horrible uh, and you decide you're not going to tell you know, somebody in your family or your friends about it, because you don't want to pass that on to them. And then they're going to have that image in their heads. And then they're going to, you know, be up or have insomnia and, and anxiety and all that, you know, mm-hmm. worrying about it and everything. So I, I feel like we do kind of have a responsibility to each other, not to like lie and cover stuff up and make pretend everything's all nicey, nicey, like 100% of the time. But in certain cases, there are. And, you know, the first sure. novel that I ever published, um, I, I couldn't get it published at first because it was too long. But also it was, um, it had this very literary style to it and uh, a lot of poetic language and description in it, etc. But it had what I used to refer to as a Sunday night movie plot. And um, that's kind of an old fashioned term, a Sunday night movie. But what what I meant by that was a thriller, right? Mm -hmm. It's um, one of those sort of cheap made for TV. Nowadays, they all seem to be like romances, but there's also a whole slew of, um, you know, women being stalked or, you know, whatever. Uh, So anyway, I couldn't publish it back then it was finally published in i think 1999 but uh i couldn't get it published back then because of this nowadays i think i could because you know the genres are not quite so strictly separated from each other um but the thing about that story is that uh sure it seems like a lot of cliches from um thrillers it's true, right? It's all based, it's all based on, on the truth and it's an amalgamation of two uh, people in a way, right? Uh, two families in a way that I made into one, but, but everything that happens in there actually actually happened. And um, I, I'm saying that now, like years and years later, like most of the people concerned in that whole issue are, have passed away. Um, but back then I would never have said that because I feel like I'm violating their privacy. Uh, and it's a small town, it's a small city, I should say. Yeah, like Winnipeg is a uh, very else, small city. Else. Um, so, yeah. Well, it's, I think it's interesting and you raised a lot of really interesting points to consider. And I think there's some really good advice in there about how to actually approach doing this and even just when to worry about it. Because I, I think often, I, you know, it never occurred to me, but I think it's a great point to point out that like so many people worry about this thing so soon when, you know, there's no one uh, holding your feet to the fire and saying you have to publish every word you write you know, and, and, you, I, and show it to somebody, you know, there's no reason you can't be you know, so much of that pre-writing or drafting or, uh, you know, testing, is there something here that is worth, you know, developing, or if that even, I even want to put public, it is so separated from, you know, actually uh, putting something public, you know, uh, and there's just, you know, so many things to consider in there. I, I remember uh, doing a pass on a novel or on the um, last book I put out, I, I went through and I just, um changed a couple of names, even though nothing, there, there, there are stories in that book that are really clearly based on real events and you use the people's real names. But then there's also like, um, I, had, I remember like one, 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 there was like a name I changed just because I knew a person that had that name and I didn't want them to think it was them even though it had no connection to them. You know what I mean? Because people, there's also this weird problem of like people always assume that writers are, you know, uh, I don't know if you find this, but I found that like, it doesn't matter how bizarre the thing I write is, they'll assume it's based on something or about them or whatever, right? If, if there's even like the slightest uh, indication 
uh, you know, it'll be, it could be about a zombie and people be like, oh, that zombie was called Paul. You know, are you talking about Paul? Uh, you know, like, I know that guy. Yeah. It's like, well, yeah, like it's just, you know, I don't know. I wanted to, one is a little P name and, and didn't occur to me or, but like, there's also that assumption you, you sometimes will have to contend with that people have, you know, that the I is the speaker, uh, you know, the I is you. And, you know, if you're writing with something, it must be based on something else. And, and also, I, I find that people have a real ownership about their experiences, even if their experiences aren't unique. You know, like if something happens to them, you know, if somebody goes to the, uh, and gets punched out, somebody gets into a, a fight outside the bar and you write about, you know, uh, how they get into a fight outside the bar, they'll act like they're the only person who's ever gotten into a fight outside the bar before. And it must be about them or even, you know, it's somehow they own it. Uh, so, you know, without trying to convince people that they need to sweep everything under the rug, I think it is worth just kind of thinking, you know, at the later stage of the project, well, what really here has to be clearly like publicly known that it is true versus what might I want to disguise or code or what is important to make really visible uh, and plain, uh, and so on and so forth. But as you say, it is kind of a thing that maybe people should worry about at a much later date than they do. Yeah. I think a fight outside the bar is like a perfect example. Um, we could probably come up with several other examples, but that, that, let's stick with that one because I think it works really well. So there's some people who will say, um, oh, you know, you, you wrote about, you know, Dick and Jane and that fight outside the bar. And you're like, no, 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 it, was, it wasn't then, right? Um, and there's other people who will come along and say, that's not how fights outside bars go, you know? Yeah. <laughs> even, <laughs> like, if, even if it happened and you're reporting, they'll say that, yeah. Yeah, that's not how it, how it happened. And uh, one of the things I've learned about writing in general is that um, in, a, in a very peculiar way, I still think you should look everything up, you know, and make sure that what you're saying is possible if you're writing uh, realistic fiction, that mm -hmm. is. Um, uh, and, I, and I do. But there's quite a few times when I've written a scene in a, you know, work of fiction, and I thought, yeah, it could happen that way, you know. And then later I go and look, look it up, and like I don't think I've, I can't remember a time when I was wrong, yeah. you know, because things can happen in so many different ways, and um, you know, so the wind can blow your hat right off your head, for example, right? Mm -hmm. it doesn't happen every time there's a wind, but. Um, you know, things happen, right? And it's, it's when you have too much coincidence in there or, you know, it seems too far-fetched, but... Or even just a late coincidence, you know, if you have a coincidence on page one, they'll give you that, uh, right? Like, uh, but yeah. page five, it's too late, you know? Right. Uh, it, it, there's all sorts of weird craft things that, as you say, like, part of it is just figuring out... Honestly, like, it sounds maybe like a cop-out to say this, but I think part of um, this like solving this problem in some ways is a matter of figuring out as you do write more uh, what can you get away with yeah. <laughs> right yeah. and, and what can you convince people um uh to accept uh, as the truth like what's the what's the sort of you know tip-offs that you can give them and not give them like there's just so many ways to guide to the reader that is hard to um that are subtle um, and, and you can guide them towards thinking this really happened or away from it thinking it really happened, right? You know, uh, depending on what your interest is. And sometimes it's like just all you have to do is think of that one sentence or, or even as a little phrase mm -hmm. to put in there, right? Um, and I like what you said about, yes, a coincidence on the first page, absolutely, right? Because nobody's thinking yet and nobody's going to say, wait, how come these how come these two characters who are like both in the same story are in the same story yeah right so but they'll uh, give it to you it's like if they're a vampire they'll accept that uh but then if the vampire runs into his aunt at a bar well that's too coincidental <laughs> right like right. there's like this weird like calculus of what the reader will accept when you know yes. yeah. and how and how you've built up the uh They'll be like, well, vampires don't uh, drink margaritas, but, but they'll accept that there's a vampire, right? <laughs> Didn't you know that? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, this set of things. So, yeah, I've often been told that 
things that happened in my uh, books were not, were impossible, but the people have never been actually correct. <laughs> that and then there's also i've heard from writers um i can't think what writer said this now but um something i was reading when i was researching for the creative process class that i teach and um the writer was saying that well people will often uh you know think that you've based a character on them right mm -hmm. but they're never they never guess correctly right because uh this one author was saying, well, that person actually was in the novel, but that was not, um, they, they chose them, they just didn't recognize themselves. Hmm. Uh, so that's also funny, I think that, um, and you know, the more you write too, like the more actual stories you publish, for example, the less it's going to matter if somebody hits somebody over the head with an egg turner, you know, and that really happened in real life because you're going to have all this other stuff out there um, as well. Yeah, it, it's, um, it's a, it's really interesting topic and I'm glad, and I'm glad you kind of were able to kind of bring it into teaching writing a little bit. I wonder before I kind of, we kind of end up, I was hoping you could talk just a little bit about that class you bring up that creative process class, because I don't know of a class like that at, many other universities um and i'm just i just find that a really interesting i wish there was a class like that when i was going to school and i was wondering if you could talk just a little bit about just kind of what that class is and what you know kind of value you find it has to teach the creative process itself um yeah. you know, when, when you're teaching writing yeah I, I invented this course um in about the year 2000 um as a as a course it was all things that i had been teaching but Put it together as a lecture course originally so um i had a number of reasons for wanting to teach it and one of those was one of the main reasons was students resistance to rewriting things so i'd be teaching creative writing and somebody would write a poem and it's like it's a first draft right poem so then i would try to encourage them to develop it further and I don't really like to say to people, you know, oh, you should put um, a seahorse, you know, in line three or, you, you know, this, this poem is sad, you should make it happier. So I don't really like to direct people, but I ask a lot of questions, right? And, um, and I might point out, you know, the second stanza, I don't understand it at all. I don't get what you're, what you're trying to say there, you know, so you need to make it more clear. These are the kind of things I usually do. Uh, and then I met this resistance in a lot of students. Um, but then it's not real. Like I wrote that out of my heart, you know, my dog that I love or, you know, whatever the situation was, the bar fight that I was in. And um, I don't want to change it, right? So, because uh, then it's not, you know, real. And what you don't like my writing, you know, or whatever, this, these kind of things. So I wanted to show them that, you know, all of, like the, all of the famous writers um, also uh, wrote and rewrote and revised and changed their minds and all of this. So one of the problems with this course is that um, really only the canonical writers um, that were kind of fetishized uh, in the culture round about um, from 1940, to like 1980 or so, um, that those are the people who donated their papers to uh, libraries. And so scholars have gone through and read their work. So it makes it very, for a very canonical course in a way. So I've got on there uh, Sylvia Plath, um, F. Scott Fitzgerald, and Hemingway, although I, I switch these writers around all the time. I haven't taught Hemingway for years now, but. Um, it's, it is really interesting. So you can see the draft, some of the draft pages. And in the case of Fitzgerald, um, there's an entire complete first, or not a first draft, but a draft of The Great Gatsby, um, which they've actually published under the name Trimalchio, which had been a title that Fitzgerald had been considering. So you can look at, and so I've, what I've done now, like this year, my students are gonna be studying the hotel scene which is very important in The Great Gatsby. It's like a crucial uh, scene. And we've got the pen, a pencil draft of that. 
uh, written in Fitzgerald's handwriting, uh, plus um, the version from Trimalchio, which is probably like the second last drafts. It's very close to the publication of The Great Gatsby. So we have, you have three versions of that hotel scene. We look at it and we say, what are the differences? What was the effect of the differences? Now we can't know what Fitzgerald was thinking. So we can't say, why did he do that? Right? What was he trying to do? Um, but we can see what direction it's moving in. And then we can look back and see, oh, he then went back and changed something else earlier. And that makes the hotel scene work even better, right? Or vice versa. And so it's really, if, if you're really interested in writing, uh, it's kind of, a, it's a great course. Um, some people get in there and they realize, oh, they weren't quite that interested in writing because we're looking at the very small things. But I, yeah. It's a fascinating uh, idea for a course to me. And like, ju just to kind of make that process more um, concrete and visible, I find is, 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 is hard. Um, I, you know, the way that I've done it in creative writing classes is I'll, I'll typically make them find a book they love and retype it. Almost all of them pick Harry Potter. And invariably by the time they, I, like they'll read, I make them retype like five or 10 pages. Um, although I recommend they do the whole book. And almost invariably they pick a book like Harry Potter and they hate it by the time they get to page three. It's just destroys their interest in the book completely, <laughs> but because they're looking really closely at like writing choices now for the first time. And so now they've, uh, their taste starts to get in, enter into it in a different way. So I don't say this to, you know, knock on Harry Potter, but just to say like, it, it tends to be the, it's a different way of looking at things uh, in that granular level. And, it, and you start to kind of realize what choices yeah. are being made. And, you know, whether they're, maybe you don't know why, but they're, you see what they are and they'll start to notice like word repetitions and things like this, you know, or, or whatever. And it becomes really, um, they, they always report that like, it's the exercise that taught them the most, but they, they hated the most as well. <laughs> That's very interesting, you know, and uh, you take, I, I think a book like Harry Potter is a kind of a fantasy book. I mean, both in, in sense of genre, but also in the sense that it's a, I think there's a dream like, I haven't actually read Harry Potter, but no, me neither. I've read books sort of similar when I was younger. And that, so you fall into a dream and you're picturing everything in your own mind, right? As you're, it's almost like a, has a movie type or dream like mm -hmm. to it. So looking at the language, and, um, and I, I would guess that when you do look at the language of Harry Potter, it's not that interesting. I don't know. I don't read those assignments. I just make them do it and, and, because it's just them retyping five yeah. pages of Harry Potter. But they 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 report to me uh, typically that. And then they also what I think is the value of it, especially for prose. I think in poetry it's easier to see what the writer is doing, whereas in prose, so many of the techniques of fiction are to hide from you what the writer is doing, right? And so uh, I've, I've when I make them redo it for fiction because it starts to just make it a little more visible. Um, and so often just because you were so immersed in it, um, now I've broken the immersion by making you retype it and it kind of becomes frustrating, but, but, you know, you can start to see it and look at it like a writer would look at it, you know? And, um, so I feel like that creative process class is almost like the, the extreme extension of that idea, you know, just looking really closely, like what are the choices made, what are the differences? And, and most importantly, like you're saying, what's the effect of the differences? Because that process, writers don't like to talk about their process uh, or they talk about it in quasi mystical ways or in a vague way that doesn't make sense, I think. And so I really like and appreciate when anything that can kind of get people closer to um, uh, the process and kind of looking at things not objectively maybe but from a, that more like objective viewpoint uh, i'll even when i when i have people do uh, editing i'll teach them uh like if they write a story say i'll make them summarize the story on another piece of paper and then make their editing decisions looking at that piece of paper without looking at the story anymore uh, because they need to separate the structure of the story out from the words they wrote Yes. before they start to attend to like the style in my opinion mm -hmm. and it's hard to do but like there's tricks to do it you know one is just you put your thing away for five months and come back to it but that's not practical in a, many cases but like uh i so I, to me like i feel like having a clearer handle on the creative process is so often um 
rather than the ideas you might have inherited about what the creative process is, is so is so much of the struggle for a, a beginning writer. Yeah, I just I just want to say one more thing about Fitzgerald because yeah, just, absolutely. A really good example is that, uh, uh, and if, if people haven't read The Great Gatsby yet, well, too bad. Spoiler alert. <laughs> Um, but anyway, he ends up uh, dying in the swimming pool outside his mansion, right? And then after Fitzgerald has already written the whole draft complete with the, with the death in the swimming pool, right, and everything, uh, one of the changes he makes is he goes way back to, I think it is like chapter three or so, um, and he has uh, Nick talking to Gatsby outside the um, pool. And in the draft, uh, Gatsby was saying, let's go to Coney Island, you know, let's go. And Nick is saying, it's late, like, it's like go to bed, you know. And, um, and Fitz comes along and he slips in this little bit where Gatsby says to him, well, let's take a swim in my pool, right? You know, do you know I've never once used that swimming pool? Mm. And wow, like later when you get to the death in the swimming pool, the irony just rings in your ears, you know, because he had built that whole mansion and the swimming pool and everything on purpose to impress a certain person. And uh, he's never actually enjoyed it. And then the one day that he goes in there, it's like, it's too late, right? Everything has already fallen yeah. apart. And um, so little things like that, I find very exciting. Um, and it hel helps students of writing, if they're paying attention, you know, and listening and doing their assignments, it, it does teach them that, you know, when you're building something, um, you don't just start from the beginning and tell the story to the end and you're done, right? You're layering it and, you know, it's more like building a house than it is, uh, you know, something flat, right? Yeah, that's so wonderful. Cool. Yeah, I didn't know that. And that's a, that's a wonderful uh, note. I think it really gets at that idea um, of that kind of nonlinear way the draft constructs itself or the palette, it, you, know, you get this palette obsess of like writing over what you've written before. Uh, and, you know, it, it can apply also, I think, to this idea that you would write over top of life or, you know, involving parts of it, um, selecting what you're going to focus on, selecting what you're going to, you know, say is true and hide <laughs> is true yeah. uh, or just fabricate wholly. Well, thanks so much for talking to me, Catherine. It's been uh, really a pleasure. Thanks, Jonathan. It's been, yeah, it's been great to spend some time just talking about writing. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank well, you. thanks again and uh, keep writing the wrong way. <laughs> <laughs>